Howdy again everyone, and today I have something new and more exciting than it might initially sound. The Sigma 500mm f5.6 DG DN OS Sports title might make it sound like just another conventional long telephoto lens at first, but can you see anything interesting going on here? Well, let's compare it to Sigma's older 500mm f4 lens. It's the size. Sigma have managed to make this new f5.6 lens 70% smaller. It's even considerably smaller than this 400mm f5.6 Canon lens that I tested a while ago. For a 500mm lens, this Sigma optic is positively tiny, and somehow Sigma have managed to achieve this without using defective optics. It really is quite an achievement, and a lens this small and yet so powerful really makes nature and wildlife photography so much easier and much more enjoyable. This is probably the most enjoyable tele lens that I have ever worked with. Comes in at a price though, £2,780 here in the UK, so probably around US dollars is no joke, and the lens is clearly aimed squarely at professionals. Despite its aperture of only f5.6, I can still imagine professionals being very interested though. If its quality is good enough, this lens could easily fit in your hand luggage on a plane, and work fine on a decent monopod, and not bump into people when shooting in a crowd. Still, it's clearly a bit of a luxury item we're dealing with here. It's designed for L-mount or Sony E-mount cameras, full frame or APS-C, and I'd like to thank Sigma UK for loaning me this lens for a week for testing, although as usual, this is a totally independent review. While the lens is certainly way smaller than anything else like it, at 1.37kg or about £3, it still has a little weight to it. The build quality feels reassuringly rock solid, with good weather sealing most visibly around the rear mount. There's room in there for teleconverters to be used also, although for this lens they're only available on L mount cameras, not Sony E. The lens comes with a tough metallic tripod mount, which can easily be turned and has little indentations for landscape or portrait orientation. Handy. There are plenty of controls around the side for focus limiting and image stabilization, which can be customized through Sigma's USB dock. As I said, the lens has its own built-in stabilization, thankfully. Here's some footage with the stabilization turned off and now turned on. As you can see, once it settles in, it does a good job holding your footage steady, although it does jerk around just a little bit. In front of that we have a large rubberized focus ring, which turns extremely smoothly, as usual, for a Sigma lens. Here you can see that the lens's manual focus response is nice and snappy, and you can also see the lens suffering from moderately strong focus breathing, zooming in as you focus more closely to your subject. In single shot mode, the lens's autofocus motor is fast, silent and accurate, although it tends to hunt just a little before locking onto your subject. Switch over to continuous autofocus mode and it's almost instantaneous, and again, accurate. In my shooting in a field, the lens had no problems tracking birds and other difficult subjects. Anyway, in front of the focus ring comes the aperture ring, which can be set to click or to turn smoothly, and usefully can be locked in or out of automatic mode. It feels a little strange having the aperture ring at the front of the lens, but honestly, I'm someone who just locks it into automatic mode most of the time, so its placement didn't bother me at all. In front of that, we get some autofocus hold buttons. The very front of the lens is rubberized to prevent damage from knocks and bumps, and it has a useful 95mm front filter thread. The lens comes with a plastic hood that screws firmly into place, in line with other professional sports and wildlife lenses. The lens also comes with Sigma's useful carry case, which has an optional strap. Overall, 10 out of 10 for build quality here. The lens is perhaps a little heavier than I expected, but it works absolutely perfectly and feels so well engineered that it'll probably still be working long after humankind is gone and the apes have taken over the planet. Alright then, image quality. Let's start by testing it on a full frame camera, my 42 megapixel Sony A7R 3 I like testing on this sensor because it's a nice happy medium between Sony's 60 megapixel and their lower megapixel cameras. In camera corrections are turned on. At f5.6, sharpness and contrast are virtually perfect in the middle of the image, and the image corners are looking pretty out of this world also. Stop down to f8 and the corners look the same. 
but the middle of the image gets just a hair's breadth of extra resolution, so small you probably won't be able to notice after YouTube's compression. At f11 and f16, diffraction kicks in and starts to soften the image, and here's f22 for anyone interested. Still, on a full frame camera it's basically 10 out of 10 for sharpness here, as well as build quality. Let's test it on a 24 megapixel APS-C camera now, for any APS-C shooters out there. At f5.6, sharpness and contrast in the middle are both good, but just a little softer than on full frame. The good news is that the corners easily look just as good. Stop down to f8 for a touch of extra punchiness to those corners, and back in the middle, sharpness has become virtually perfect again. Again though, stop down to f11 or f16 for diffraction to start introducing softness to the image. So, on APS-C, we could be seeing just a little more sharpness at f5.6, but it's still a pretty solid performance indeed, with excellent contrast. Ok, let's turn off in-camera corrections and take a look at distortion and vignetting on a full-frame camera. The lens is projecting only a negligible amount of pincushion distortion here, and also vignetting is very low, even at the widest aperture. At f8, the corners are more or less fully bright. So, we're treated to a fantastic performance here too. Despite the lens's comparatively tiny size, vignetting is nicely under control. The lens's minimum focus distance is 3.2 meters, so not very close really, but at least it's close enough for shooting small birds. Close up image quality is a little softer than before at f5.6, but at f8, we see excellent sharpness again. When it comes to shooting against bright light, the lens turns in an excellent performance here too. No flaring is really visible, unless you're shooting right against the light source itself. Again, that's peace of mind for wildlife photography if you're shooting when the sun is low. And finally, bokeh. At 500mm, even an f5.6 lens can offer deeply out of focus backgrounds, especially when using a full frame camera, and even quite difficult backgrounds are rendered fairly smoothly by this lens. Overall, the upside of the Sigma 500mm f5.6 is of course its very small size, which is genuinely, practically useful, as well as, of course, its excellent professional image quality and fast autofocus. The one and only downside is its very hefty price. There are definitely cheaper ways than this to get to 500mm, so it all depends on where your priorities are. But I can tell you now, if I was a pro wildlife photographer with a bit of money behind me, I'd probably make this lens my first choice. Using something like this is just so much more enjoyable than trying to use something really big and heavy, and its reach is still very good, so it certainly does come recommended. Thanks for watching everyone, and a big thanks again to my Patreon supporters who get all kinds of exclusive bonus content and early access to videos. Check it out in the description below. Oil Vahor Paub, Aguela Hieto.